I'll start this story about telling about my, mo my mother and father and my grandparents. My grandparents on my mother's side, Max and Lena Harris, were raised and born and raised in Lithuania. And while they were still rather young, they went to England, hunting for better conditions. And there they changed the name to Harris and it's kind of lost exactly what their name was. But they arrived in Detroit and they settled down and they had 11 children. And uh, Max made a good uh, living as a tailor and Lena took care of the 11 kids, which was quite a task, I imagine. My grandparents on my father's side were Catherine and Edward Purdy. Uh, their ancestors came from England probably in the 1700s. They settled down Detroit and had five children. Uh, Edward was a captain on a sailing ship. He owned the ship, actually, and in fact, he likely owned three sailing ships on the Great Lakes. Catherine mainly was raising the five kids while Edward is sailing. And they, they, the kids said that they spent a lot of my father, especially said they spent a lot of time aboard the sailing ships. And to them, it was great fun. They all loved it. My mother, was Eleanor Harris Purdy, and she was born in Detroit. She was a lovable, nurturing person. She was in, nurse, in uh, nursing school as a training to be a registered nurse when she met my father. They fell in love and got married. Then she spent most of the rest of her life taking care of the four children. She died in 1989 at the age of 91. My father, Harry Martin Purdy, was born near Detroit, and he was a very dedicated, accomplished man. He worked very, very hard, and often under very difficult conditions, unbelievably, for example, during the Depression. There he had a hard, hard time. He died in 1972 at the age of 75. I was born in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin in December 23rd, 1919, a long time ago. And at that time in our family, my brother Harry was there and he was uh, th three years old at that time. And later, uh, over the couple of years, two more brothers arrived in the family. One was first was Alan, born in 1923, and then later Jimmy, who was born in 1931. Uh, Sturgeon Bay was a small port on Lake Michigan, which is a huge lake. And the, in that port, my father, uh, because the port was used for servicing ships, repair of ships, and so on, my father um, worked there as a machinist. And he was, that was getting near the start of his career in the, in the mechanical fields and the tool and die making engineering. Uh, my Uncle Pearl lived in this with his wife, my Aunt May, uh, lived in this uh, small port. And Uncle Pearl was a diver, he prof a professional diver. He dived down with his big equipment and fixed things on ships like propellers that were loose or odds and ends of that sort. And it was a pretty dangerous job. And especially his wife, May, uh, said it'd be a good idea if he'd do something else because it's too dangerous. So he did. He, uh, while we were there, he quit the job 
and he went as a sailor on the Great Lakes on the big boats that carry ore and all sorts of other material. And we found out later, this was a couple of years later, we found out that, uh, got news from Aunt May that his ship was uh, turned over in a huge storm and all of the people aboard died. And that was a very sad thing. Oh, but my two brothers who were going coming down the pike, you might say, uh, I always felt very lucky to have these three brothers of mine throughout most of my life. They were around and we were friends and they were good guys and bright guys and did a lot of things, as you hear later. Well, at this point, the family, after, when I was, before I was a year old, the family moved back to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my mother was, that's where my mother was born in, in Detroit, and my father born nearby in Port Huron. And I remember at that point that as, as I was, got a few years older, I was having a lot of trouble with asthma. And it turned out that my whole life was, uh, I had asthma in my whole life. Most of the time, it was light enough so I could carry on normal activities. But the early years were the worst. And I missed a lot of school in the kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. And um, it was pretty tough. They had to prop me up with pillows so I could sit up at night when I was sleeping. And at that point, I realized that my brother, Be Harry, became sort of my protector because I was, was a skinny, kind of weak kid with asthma. And other people would pick on me, and Harry would be there, and he would take care of it all that and, and help me out. So that was um, uh, a very good thing. And uh, about that time, Alan was born in 1923. And things were going along well for the family. My father had, uh, by 1929, had already entered into his engineering career, automotive engineer, that he held for the rest of his uh, work career. And uh, Dad also, we lived in a big apartment. He had one room there that he used. He bought some drafting tables, and he had a class. He made a little money on the side, so to speak, uh, in this class he gave on tool and die design. Uh, at that time, almost all of my uncles and aunts and relatives were living in Detroit, too. They were all in, mostly in the auto industry, except my Uncle Dave, who uh, ran an illegal, what they called a blind pig at that time, and served uh, alcohol up until the prohibition ended and made a lot of money. Then something happened that was to change our life in a, over the years and in some ways forever. Uh, there was a stock market crash of ni October 1929. To us boys at this age, Harry and I and Alan too, it didn't mean very much because life went on according long like it always did happen. But we were vaguely aware that there were big things happening out. We saw people lining up in soup lines and uh, all sorts of uh, awful looking things, but we weren't very affected and didn't know what it really meant at that time. Uh, my father was still working, and in a couple of years later, in 1931, Jimmy was born. And the family went along doing basically well we were starting, the older of us, myself and uh, Harry, were entering school. And then, the year following that, there, the crash hit us with a vengeance because my father had lost his job, and we were aware something was wrong in the family then, but not, everything was covered up. My mother just said, like, don't worry, and all that sort of thing, and everything's okay, and so on. And then one fine day, we were evicted from our apartment, non-payment of rent. And it was a catastrophe. Here were the four of us boys out on the street 
with part of our furniture and baggage and so on. And fortunately, at that point, my uh, Uncle Charlie came to our rescue because he was still working and making good money. And he got us out of that and helped pay for us to get us into temporarily and at least into a place to live. But this was very traumatic. At that point, uh, I was approaching 12, 13 years old, and I began, and my, my older brother Harry, we began talking about the awful things going on because we saw it. We saw it, the tens of thousands of people out on the street. Demonstrations were starting, do something, get us food. And then my father was lucky enough to get a job in Flint, Michigan. And that was at the Buick uh, Automobile Factory uh, as an engineer. And by this time, he had a certain network of friends among these specialized automotive engineers. And so we picked up our life. Of course, when we left, we left right in the middle of the term. And we left our friends. And it was pretty traumatic for us because going then we started into a new school and we were behind in the classes and just what you'd expect with a, with a tearing of the roots and so on. But we at least we were eating and getting reasonable clothes and that sort of thing. And uh, both Harry and I were the older ones. Well, Alan started going to school too, but uh, Harry and I were in junior high school and he was in high school already. And uh, we took up something new for us. We took up tennis. And we both became good tennis players. We were on the, t uh, he was on the high school team then, and I, the next place we went, I was on the high school team there too. So that was a new thing, a, a great thing for me. And it was good for my asthma because I was getting a good exercise. And the asthma was reasonably light at that point. So as things settled down for about a year, at this point, suddenly, Dad was laid off again, fired, he was off of work, and we were in a big mess again and couldn't hardly play the rent. We, we, uh, we still had his old car, and uh, so we went down to Detroit, and in the outskirts of Detroit, we found this old house, a beat-up old thing, <coughs> and uh, they rented it with a few bucks they had, and this house was really something because it had no running water. It did have a pump in the backyard so you could pump water out in a bucket. And that was nice. <laughs> but uh, uh, it also didn't have an indoor toilet. It had what they called uh, in those days an outhouse, which was a non-water with just a hole in the ground with a little shack over it. One of the things that, we, that I think is interesting about this house with no running water is that we had a big galvanized tub that we used for bathing. They'd heat water up in buckets and fill it up. And typically what would happen was a Saturday night ritual, and that is the four boys took a bath. And we started with the oldest and worked right down to the last one, which was Jimmy. And by then the water was getting a little slippery or slimy or something. But nevertheless, it worked. We all managed to get clean and last the next for the next week. Uh, after a short while, my dad got a job in Lansing, Michigan. And that was time for a big celebration, of course, except we, all of us boys felt pretty sad because we were leaving our friends again in the middle of a semester. It was very traumatic for young people to do that. But we were glad that, that my father was working and we were back to work and so on. And in Lansing, um, I entered my first year of high school. It was just finishing his last year, and we were both on the high school tennis teams. And that was a, it was played a big part in my life, tennis, at that point. And the other thing that began looming up was politics, because it was a different time. Everybody was talking. Everybody had trouble. Millions were still laid off. At, at the uh, most of the Depression, 
20 to 30 percent of the people of, that had jobs were laid off of those jobs. Now some of them would get a temporary job just like my father was doing and, and work for a little while and be laid off again. But there were millions, millions of people on the street and the country is becoming politicalized. Roosevelt was the president at this point and he was a sort of a, a liberal uh, aristocrat in a way but he was a guy that was subject to the pressures because people were marching 10,000, 20,000, 30, 50,000 people were marching in the street demanding jobs, demanding food. And Roosevelt went along with that. He said, yes, yes, all right, we're going to do things. And the social programs be of the 30s began then. Uh, th they were viewed as radical programs. And now, of course, everybody knows what they are, and they go, oh, number one was unemployment insurance. So when you got laid off, then you would get some kind of a minimum pay that would keep you going. And another one, of course, was Social Security, which was a whole new thing that had never been done to guarantee that people would get at least some minimal amount of income when they uh, retired. And there were other benefits from Social Security, too. Uh, also, there were uh, programs started, work get, job programs, the best, best way to call it. And that is, the biggest one was the Works and Under the Works Progress Administration, commonly called the WPA. And, the, and then there was also the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was for young people and predominantly predominantly men and boys. Uh, that was called the CCC. So between those two programs, they were helping a lot. More people were getting back to work, although it wasn't enough. And uh, there was still a huge crisis. And more and more, again, people were getting politicalized and engaging in protests and pressure on the government to do more things. My dad was laid off from his job in Rio, in, in Lansing, and we moved back to Detroit. And things were tough, things were hard, but we were getting by on the little money he saved. And my mother was an expert in putting things together, uh, like pieces of cardboard in the shoes that would last just to get to school and back. And of the hand-me-downs from the older boys that are getting down and, and that sort of thing and sewing and buttons on and all sorts of uh, cloth sewing to make us look in reasonable shape. Uh, so my father was still hunting for a job and I was in my last year of high school. This was uh, 1937 already and Harry went off to the CCC with the government job program. Uh, to, he spent about a year there. And then and our, our, at that point, our tennis team was doing really well. My tennis was at its height, as it turned out. And uh, we won the state championship. And we got a, a picture in the newspaper. So that was quite a thrilling event. And at that point, I was graduated from high school. And at that point, shortly before that, my dad got a job in Cadillac. And that job lasted through the rest of the Depression until he retired. It was a good job, and he loved it. Uh, one of the side benefits was they would let him take a Cadillac home, and he would evaluate the riding qualities and things. And of course, everybody joked about that because he was really enjoying riding around the big Cadillac <laughs> after, after the Depression days, you can imagine. So anyhow, Harry came back from the uh, CCC and uh, we were together a while before he went out to University of Michigan. And we talked a lot between us and our friends and Alan also was beginning, Jimmy was a little young, and we talked politics. And we were coming to the conclusion of many, many Americans at that time, 
millions of Americans who were becoming communists, socialists, and progressives of one type or another, and a, a, few, a few anarchists too. We at that time developed socialist ideals. We thought that was the way to solve the problem of the world and of the countries and what mess we were in. So Harry went off to University of Michigan uh, using a good part of the money he earned in the CCC. And I had graduated and my next step was to, well, the first thing I, in the summers, I worked in between the summer of graduation and going to Wayne City College then, is now Wayne University, uh, and I took engineering there. But I worked in the summer in a machine shop, which I was lucky to get. In fact, it was through the influence of my father that I got that job. The best thing about this rather horrible job in the machine shop, because who likes working 10 hours nights anyhow, not to mention low pay and all that. But what I did, I spent those three months, while I was working hard, I studied very carefully all the basic operations of all the machines I could. And I asked questions, and I did a little practice on a different machine. and. That was to benefit me for the rest of my life. Uh, it, it was a, a sort of a little bit of a lesson in basic machining, which I needed in my future as a tool and die maker, uh, teacher, and uh, engineer. It was a tough situation in that ma machining then day because it wasn't a union shop. Because in the meanwhile, the union had had come into all the major auto companies. There were the big sit-down strikes in Flint, and the union won, and it was marvelous. And conditions improved, but people, what people don't know is conditions in these shops, even though the money was good for those days and benefits and all that, was the work was tough, hard, monotonous, killing stuff. And I got some of that in this, in this summer. I worked in this machine shop. And I worked on the night shift, or the, well, it was a night shift. It was a 10-hour day, and it started in 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I believe it was 3 o'clock I got off. And I made, I forget what I made, but it didn't mean, it's rather meaningless, but something like 50 cents an hour, something like that, which would be equivalent now to about uh, 5 or $6 an hour. <clears throat> and it was a tough non-union shop, and you had to work like hell or else you got in trouble, they just fire you for nothing. So at that point, I was ready to go to university. This traumatic depression that affected nearly everybody's lives had a positive side to it in, in a certain sense because it had a, a cultural side to it in uh, songs, uh, movies such as Grapes of Wrath, plays, and all sorts of things. This inspired artists of all types to do this. And I just like these. We all like the singing of Pete Seeger. I don't want your millions, mister. I don't want your diamond ring. All I want just the right to live, mister. Give me back my job again. I know you have the land need, mister. The money is all in your name. But where's the work that you did, mister? I'm demanding back my job again. I don't want your millions, mister. I don't want your diamond ring. Oh, I want just the right to live, mister. Give me back my job again. Brother Harry had quite a time at the University of Michigan. He was in his element there. He, it, it, he had a marvelous situation. And he began writing. That was one of his big interests in life, uh, was writing. 
And he wrote an article that was published in Esquire magazine in 1930, I believe it was uh, seven. And he also wrote uh, for literary magazines that some big names were published that he was published with. And um, he also became acquainted with uh, Arthur Miller, the playwright, at this time, and they remained friends for years. And he began doing all sorts of political things out to University of Michigan. The radical groups he was in, they, one thing they did was uh, uh, helped organize many employees of the university who were not union and were very low paid, low wage. So that was one of the practical sides. And they also helped organize a machine shop in Ann Arbor where University of Michigan is. And he also wrote two radio plays that were played on the various stations around, uh, around Michigan. So he did great. Harry met a marvelous woman at Ann Arbor and they got closer and closer and finally they got married. And her name was Annabelle and Annabelle Hill. And Annabelle at the University of Michigan was elected to the student government on the communist ticket. That's the way things went during the Depression. There was a lot of uh, radical things that were working out. At, at Wayne University, where I was started in uh, uh, studying engineering, and uh, it was a marvelous time for me. I liked it very much. I was still living home, which I wasn't as happy with. I would have liked to be out to the University of Michigan, but it's a question of money. And, um, so I was living home, going to the streetcar, uh, down to school, and so on. And I found a, a marvelous social and political life there. The, it, everybody was active. Things were happening. And one thing that I particularly remember is uh, the time that a huge group of students went down to the German consulate in Detroit and picketed. That was the time of the Nazis, when the Nazis were in control by that time. And we picketed that consulate and were roughed up by the police and that sort of thing. But we got a lot of attention and a lot of people were start thinking about this Nazi threat that was coming up in Europe. After one year at uh, Wayne University, I decided to, for a number of reasons, to go out to the University of Michigan and join Harry. Uh, Harry had found a job for me in a restaurant, is what they call a pearl diver in those days, which is a dishwasher. And uh, he also found me a cheap room to live in. And so when I came out to Ann Arbor, uh, that Harry helped me so much in getting things going here. And so I settled right down into it and began uh, uh, my more of my career as an engineer. Uh, there, things were very exciting things went on there. And among other things, I met um, my future wife, uh, Gladys Weinberg, who was also in the radical movement at that time, like, well, lots of people were. So it went along nicely. And, um, but my asthma began bothering me coming back heavily. I had these periods, and it was bothering me, and, and it was very bad in, a in Ann Arbor because of the huge amount of trees there and all that sort of thing. This especially bothered me. So I decided to uh, leave for a while, and I went back to Detroit. And after, that's where this Gladys Weinberg lived, and we ran around a bit, and then we just got married. We got a little apartment, settled down, and I got into uh, ma various machine shops there, worked. And uh, there was one big machine shop I hired into that was not union, and I hired into that uh, because the union asked me to. Uh, we started a, a uh, organizing committee, and I was the chairman of the organizing committee. And uh, I spent uh, a better part of a year there and we never, at that point, never did succeed in getting the union in. 
after the war, this place was uh, organized into the United Auto Workers, which I was uh, very active in. Harry had graduated from the University of Michigan, and uh, they were uh, uh, living in Detroit. Annabelle and Harry were living in Detroit. And at that point, the uh, German Nazis invaded Poland, and war was on the horizon. Everybody knew that the world was going to be really involved in this war. Uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and the United States was in the war. Shortly after that, um, possibly I think it was close to a year after that, the uh, Harry and I and Alan decided that we must go and fight in this war. None of us liked war. None of us liked the military. Still don't. But these were times in which we were highly political people and we wanted to fight fascism. Uh, and so the three of us enlisted in the Air Corps. Uh, it was known as the Army Air Corps at that point. And we went down the same day and enlisted, and uh, there was a, a, a for somehow the uh, a newspaper uh, photographer was there. He took a picture of the three of us, and it was published in the Detroit News. I joined the Air Corps. Not only, um, well, it was a question of fighting fascism. It's a political statement it's making, and. Uh, Actually, I wouldn't be drafted because I was working on already and working on war work and the various machine shops I was working at. Uh, but I joined the Air Corps because I've had a lifelong love of aviation airplanes. When I was a kid, uh, early teenagers, I started building model airplanes. And in fact, all of us did, Harry and Alan and uh, a little later, Jimmy. But I was very interested in that, and that's why I went in the Air Corps uh, instead of some other units. And also with my asthma, which I sort of con I concealed. I didn't tell the Air Corps I had that. They wouldn't let me in. But it was, I was in a good period then, and uh, so I just ignored that. Uh, Harry and I and Alan, we all separated and went different training places. Um, the uh, place that I went was in Texas. <laughs> and in advanced training is where they separated the fighter pilots from the bomber pilots. And, uh, and I was supposedly going to be a fighter pilot. And I flew several fighters, um, a P-40 and a P-39. I uh, rather, no, not 39, 30, uh, 36, uh, P-36 in advanced training. And at that point, I graduated and... Uh, I received my wings and also my commission as a second lieutenant. Shortly after I received my wings, uh, Harry graduated and also was commissioned as a second lieutenant. And he went directly into bombers. Um, Alan, in his, he was into his advanced training when he got a, a very odd virus, uh, a viral disease of the lungs, that, and they decided to discharge him, even though he was known at that time as a hotshot pilot and so on, but they did discharge him. So Alan left the military. Um, Harry and I saw each other once during training, when we just, by a fluke, we did, and uh, that I didn't know then that that was the last time I would ever see Harry. I went off to my training as a fighter pilot, and they took a, a, a big group of us, some 50 of us, and put us in a room, and the colonel talked about the heavy losses in bomber, that even though we were be training to be fighter pilots, that we would be transferred into bombers, and we were. So uh, the first thing I knew, I was uh, a, a co-pilot in training of a B-24 bomber, that's a four-engine bomber. And it was one of the most important 
airplanes in the war, there were more of them than any other single aircraft, this B-24. Um, I kind of missed the fighters who were sort of like a sports car compared to a truck, but uh, what are you going to do? I was still in co-pilot position, but I was uh, then checked out, even though I didn't get a crew myself, I was checked out as a first pilot. Shortly after that, there was a, um, a crew that had the co-pilot get uh, uh, pretty badly sick, and they asked if some, anybody would uh, take this job and go over now overseas. So I decided, well, sooner or later, and I did, and I went over. We, we were issued a new airplane, B-24, and we flew it over on the southern route uh, to Europe. We stopped at uh, Algeria, Algiers, and we just stayed uh, again overnight. Various things were done to the plane. We went on to Morocco, which is Casablanca, and stayed for three, four days there because they did certain processing to the plane uh, to prepare it for combat, testing the machine guns, pulling the de-icer boots off, and that sort of thing. Then we flew to uh, Tunisia in a desert base and uh, after a little we were a replacement crew us and our, our airplane and us we were replacement for ones that had gone or shot down or whatever the case may be and we began flying our missions uh, over Europe we mainly at that point flew over Greece and we usually bombing ports or railroad yards, um, factories, and that sort of thing. And we started going here and we went here and there and it was very traumatic and very scary. I was scared. Every mission I was scared. And so was everybody else, except one or two very odd chaps that didn't, who got, seemed to get off on that whole thing. And uh, one reason, of course, I was scared is because you were flying over enemy territory and the danger was there. Almost every mission, there was what we call flak in the sky. That was anti-aircraft gun shells that went up and exploded all over the field. Everything we attacked, there were guns guarding it and shooting at us. Planes were shot down. And of our group of, uh, well, there were over 20 planes, but we normally flew a eight, eight, uh, 18 uh, plane squadron. And we often got hit. Our plane would have a piece of flak go through it. And then also to add to the, the horror of the whole thing was the fact that German fighters attacked us. And these were difficult. We had machine guns, 10 machine guns on our plane 50 calibers that we fired at them and there was air battles and planes were shot down. People I knew were shot down and disappeared. We didn't know what happened to them. Some of them we saw go down in flames and we knew they all died. And we got back, we would be debriefed by intelligence and then we would go over to the officers club and drink. Not dr drunk drinking, but I mean, you know, drink and talking about other things. We never talked much about the war at that point. We needed relief and that sort of thing. In a, in a short time, our group moved up from uh, Tunisia up to southern Italy in the heel and down near Brindisi at a small airfield called San Pancrazio. And we continued flying. Uh, we bombed a lot in north Italy because the Germans were bringing tanks and equipment in and we were bombing them uh, quite successfully. We had an easy mission coming up. They used to call it a milk run. It wasn't far away, maybe two and a half hours flying time. We were going to bom bomb a small town, an Italian town called Vicenza. And the railroad yard was full of German equipment. We arrived uh, at Vicenza and the uh, flak was very heavy 
And a huge amount of German fighters jumped our squadron because somehow, not our squadron, our group it's called, uh, they mobilized to try to get us. They knew somehow ahead of time it was happening through their intelligence. And there was a horrendous battle. Planes began going down in flames. A parachute, we saw parachutes coming off. And we were, uh, it went on for about only 10 minutes. But there were a huge amount of planes shot down. Out of our 18 planes, there were 10 shot down. And remember, 10, there were 10 men in each of these planes. That's 100 men went down. And the statistics the Air Corps gave out was approximately, if you got shot down, you had about a 50-50 chance of living and other, you know, and, or dying. So our plane was hit. And it, was, it, it, it didn't seem so scary at first because we're busy. You're up there flying the plane and talking on the interconnected com and talking to people and saying, okay, watch this over to the right, and here comes a couple of fighters in the run, and so on. The, the air was filled with flak and machine gun tracer bullets, and we were hit again, and we began losing control, and we knew that we were going to go down. So we told the crew, get your chutes on and jump. Don't fool around, jump now. They also told us that we were up in the cockpit and they told us that four of the men were dead in the back. The planes spiraled down out of control with people jumping out. Everybody jumped out except the four men and we were all separated going down our parachutes. I was the last man out and I was suddenly suspended there holding the parachute straps, and I was in a daze, a shock. Suddenly, no roar of engines, nothing up there except me going down my parachute. And then our tail came by, flipping over and over, not too far from me, kind of scary, except I wasn't in a scare mood then, I was in shock. And finally, I landed, made a good landing with my parachute, and this was December 28, 1943, and there were a lot of great fields and that, but there were no leaves, so visibility was gone. There was snow on the ground, and I pulled my parachute. I buried it, as the manual said to do, and buried it under the snow quickly, and just then two Italians came running over, and they said, we'll help you, follow us. So I, I started running with them, Unfortunately, a motorcycle with a sidecar with Germans came very close to us, running down. The Italians run and die, hid. I ran and dived in a ditch, but in, the, in a matter of seconds, I heard the German voice saying uh, something like surrender, something like that. And I stood up, and they took me over to the, motor, the motorcycle with a sidecar put me in, and off we went. My two soldiers that had captured me uh, delivered me first to the nearest airfield, and then I was locked in a room, and uh, then a truck came along that was picking up captured people, many of whom were injured. So I was brought out to the truck and put in the back of the truck with about 15 other uh, guys, most of them from our outfit, and four or five of them were wounded and just sort of patched up with band-aids type thing, uh, one with a, one over his eye, and um, it was a very gloomy moment. Then they took us up to Bolzano, which is a city that we had bombed before, uh, the entrance to the Brenner Pass going up into uh, Austria and Germany. And after due time, they took, it was winter as I said, and very cold outside. We were into the, into the Alps and uh, they took our leather jackets away as they put us on the train. And the purpose was that, was if we tried to escape, you 
wouldn't last very long up in the Alps with all the snow and the mountain and the cold, you know. So we went on the train, we went through, and um, we didn't know where we were going. They wouldn't tell us anything. And we arrived up in Frankfurt on the Main, and the train we were in pulled in, and uh, we got out. There were, at that time, four or five guards uh, uh, handling us. And uh, we went out, they marched us outside. The railroad, they, this uh, railroad station was pretty beat up. There'd been some nearby bombings uh, and uh, it had collapsed part of it and that sort of thing. So they marched us over and oddly enough, we thought this, we were sort of almost giggling about this, even though we weren't in a very good mood for humor at that point, was they, they marched us together. And as we marched us over toward to get on a streetcar that went out to a place called Dulag Luft, which was an interrogation center. And uh, we didn't like the sound of that that we'd heard. And as we marched along, we were attacked by several Germans, apparently, who lived there, who kept, and one I remember very well because he was running down the line with his umbrella, whacking on everybody, including me, he hit me too, and he was yelling out in English, Jewish gangsters from Chicago, Jewish gangsters from Chicago, you know? And I sort of thought to myself, well, uh, I'm from Detroit and I'm only part Jewish, actually, but it, that's, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> so anyhow, we got in the streetcar and went down, and they marched us into this camp, of course, covered with barbed wire and all that, and typical barracks and things. The only thing was different. They threw us all in this very small rooms individually, and we were left to sit there for some six, seven hours or something. And um, then they pulled us out sort of one by one and interrogated us and tried to get information out of us. And when they brought me in, they brought me in, there was a, a rather ugly sergeant, German sergeant, who spoke pretty fair English. And he said, you know, after I sat down, he said, uh, I would like to know a lot of things from you, and you will tell me them, and I will write them down. First of all, I want to know, where is your airfield? Where were you flying from? And I said at that point, remembering my instructions from the Air Corps, my name is Robert Patetetete. My uh, serial, Army serial number is 06386888. And that's under the Geneva Convention. I don't have to tell any more. And he said, you will tell me everything. And he asked a few more questions, and I declined to talk about it. And uh, then he said, all right, we will take care of you later. If you don't answer, you will be shot. Well, that scared the hell out of me. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, that sort of went on. This game went on, and I didn't see anybody else except these uh, guards and so on that, and the sergeant, which I had several sessions with and was really getting scared because I, I felt he was just going to, you know, I was going to get shot. That's all there is to it. Anyhow, I guess they got tired of the game, and some people did, talked and some didn't, and you know, and uh, so it ended up that a few, oh, after th three and a half days, they put me on a, a, brought me down to Frankfurt and put me on a freight car, and it was a special kind of freight car for bringing human beings around that the Germans had a lot of at that time. They had. Uh, uh, ones they used for transporting Jews and prisoners they were sending to concentration camps. Well, the boxcar was pulled by a train and stopped several places, and more and more prisoner of war got on, and pretty soon our boxcar was full. It, there wasn't even room for uh, 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 people to lay down. We were in this boxcar for um, almost two days. And the, f the first stop as we were going along um, was Berlin. And we arrived at night. And the train stopped. And we heard 
explosions. And we found, finally found out that the other end of the Martian yard was being bombed by the Royal Air Force, the RAF. And they didn't know we were there, of course. And this was really scary. And the German guards got out of there, out of the boxcar, and they went and hid in re concrete revetments so they could keep us covered with their guns and still not let us out. And we just sat there. And it was awful. We had nothing to drink. We had nothing to eat, hardly. Oh, one thing we had to drink, finally, was ersatz coffee, which is a real treat. If you like coffee or you don't, you're going to hate this stuff. Now, fortunately, after about an hour and a half, the bombing stopped. Then the train, the guards got back in, and the train went off. And we went off, up, straight up above Berlin, near a little town called Bart which is about two kilometers from the Baltic. And there was Stalag Luf 1, our prison camp, which I was to be in for the next year and a half. Uh, this was a very unpleasant place. It was not a death camp, like so many camps in Germany were, but it was a not good treatment camp. They, we were frequently hungry, and most of the food we had was fairly bad food, except we did get some Red Cross parcels from Switzerland they sent them over. So that kind of helped to keep us alive. Because one gets tired of rotten potatoes and other terrible foods. The, the bread was like, you'd, you'd, when you cut the bread, which there wasn't enough of, it, it's sort of like sawdust came out of it. And, uh, but we got so we looked forward to that because you get hungry, you get hungry. Then also the other problem, we, we got cold. The Baltic as winter came. This was, this was already winter, and uh, in winter the Baltic is the cold sea. And the, and the very cold breezes came in and we had, didn't have enough cold to keep the furnace going, except for very brief periods. So we just shivered and rolled over and laid on top of newspapers and all the, slept in our clothes and that sort of thing. All in all, a pretty boring place. Scary, too, because we you know, knew exactly what was going to happen. If we didn't win the war, we'd be shot, and we knew it. And we, we've, we knew we'd win the war. We had faith that we would win the war. Everything seems to be that. And during our, my time there, they also had a radio, a secret radio, which they took apart in little parts and was built by some uh, RAF guys who uh, how they got some of the parts, I don't know, but they did. And what they used to do is they, they would listen to the s certain people hidden away in different barracks. We were all in barracks. Uh, when I got there, there were less than 1,000 prisoners. They were all air officers only in this prison. Anyhow, they, they would then put down the, uh, write down the news, and somebody would walk around. We watched the Germans all the time to make sure there were none coming our way. And they walked in, and they read this, what they called the Red Star News, which was uh, interesting in itself. And they read the, they would get all the tidbits of, and where the armies were and so on that made us feel good because we were gradually winning. The, our typical day was a boring day. We got up in the morning and we would get out and there'd be a roll call. We'd all light up and they'd count us for about an hour, an hour and a half, no, no matter what the weather. And then we'd uh, go back in and take care of certain duties we had to do, sort of live. Uh, and one of the things I was involved in very soon was e escape attempts. And I was working on, I was uh, sort of assigned to a big tunnel. It's supposed to be the biggest tunnel ever built in Stalag Luf 1. There's been several little ones built there, and actually a few people escaped, not many. And uh, so I learned a lot about tunnel building, and not in a practical way, like for automobiles in the Hudson Tunnel in New York or something. These were little tiny t tunnels little oval-shaped things that just big enough for the body, and we would crawl in there. And it was very scary because 
little chunks of earth would fall, and we were all hoping no big chunks would fall and crush us. And we knew what the Germans were doing mostly, not everything, because they had the one group of Germans, the Abwehr, they called them, uh, and they lived in one barracks, and they were the ones that watching the stop escape attempts. So we watched them all the time, especially when the tunnel digging was in operation. And uh, so the tunnel went on and on, and that was a good part of our day was digging in the tunnel. And of course, at night we were locked up. About by the time it got dark, they came around and shut all the uh, window covers and locked them so we couldn't get out after dark. And well, there was all sorts of things people may do to try to entertain themselves. There was people that did a play and uh, other sort of things. There was a singing group that got together and, and that sort of thing, uh, even though they weren't at night because were, you know, everybody was locked up. But another factor, of course, was boredom, too, because even though we were busy in the tunnel project and so on, it um, just wasn't home. That's all there is to it. And we didn't know what was going to happen to us. And we thought about the people back home. And we thought about and started talking about um, some of the things that were happening and about good meals we had and food. And it, it really, there's somebody in there who passed the word around, do not talk about food. This is a very destructive thing. Somebody who was a bit of a psychologist uh, was setting the word around. And it's a little bit like the uh, <clears throat> our meals were pepped up one day by a cat. The poor devil happened to stray through the camp. And usually there were a number of camps around, I mean, enough for cats around. But usually um, when they strayed into the camp, they never left. And the reason why is they got eaten. And that's the way it went. I happened to eat one meal of cat myself, and it was very good. It tasted a little bit like rabbit. I don't think that people should necessarily do that. I'm not advocating eating cats. It's just I'm saying that this is what happens sometimes under very unusual circumstances. We were getting more and more good news in. Uh, of course, the biggest news was uh, the D-Day invasion from England invading France. And this was in um, June 6, 1944. And the Russian armies were making big progress. And things were looking better and better. And basically, we kind of abandoned the tunnel because people were scared to escape. Because when you escape, uh, you're still in danger. You're in the middle of Germany. And even if you could speak Germany, German is not, you don't have the papers and all the whole thing. So it's a very dangerous thing. And we also picked up from our radio that um, the big escape in our, our sister camp, Air, uh, Air Officer Camp, Stalagrov Three, that the, some 80 uh, people have escaped out of a tunnel. And very few got away. Only a half a dozen did make it out completely. And the Germans uh, had captured, and they shot 50 of the prisoners, which is, of course, not only inhumane, but is against the Geneva Convention, because under the Geneva Convention, the uh, escape from prison camp is a legitimate military uh, endeavor. Uh, so our, I think there was a little carelessness and left some marks where we pulled a uh, dirt out, and the Germans discovered this, and they discovered the tunnel. And all of us, we knew when they came there with their digging equipment what was going to happen. We'd all been, by then, hidden away in corners and not doing that anymore. And anyhow, that, that, that ended the tunnel. And we never started another one. The war was really winding down. The Germans they were backing up. The Russians were pushing close to Berlin. And the Allies were swarming around over into Germany. and. The end was in sight. And one fine day in May 1st, 
45, uh, two Russian scouts came, actually I think there were three or four, in a, in a motorcycle type vehicle, they came to our camp. By then, the German guards had left. They took off during that night. We were watching them at night, and uh, there was organization, you know, an escape committee and uh, the organization, the camp, led by the colonel, the uh, oldest colonel there, and we, we saw it was happening. When the Germans left, we knew that the Russians were near, and the German, the Russians, first two Russians come in and say, yes, this is the third Ukrainian army under Marko Rokossovsky will be here tomorrow morning in force to take over the town and the whole thing. Oh, well, we were, we were, you know, we couldn't sleep that night. We were all going crazy with joy and dancing practically and things like that. And sure enough, the, 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 this army did come in and took over the camp and it was a, a, a stunning thing for us. We were just unbelievably happy and screaming out loud and there were some people in the camp who'd yell out, come on Joe, come on Joe Stalin, and uh, that sort of thing. And then they got us all together and the Russian general, uh, uh, the, he wasn't a general, he was a um, <coughs> marshal, <coughs> Marshal, Marshal Rokossovsky, and he spoke to he, us. And he said roughly, he said, don't want you guy, what do you do why? And we eventually found that uh, to mean, from now you are safe, the war will be over shortly, and we'll be welcome, allies. Well, then a lot of things happened pretty quickly because the war was getting over. Within a few days, the... Uh, uh, War in, in Europe, the war in Europe ended on May 8th, just a week later. And, oh, when the Russians came in and took over the camp, the next morning, about two or three dozen guys took off and just went over the fence. And we were all supposed to, our barracks was supposed to keep order and stop people. We couldn't stop them. They just said, eh, ah, yeah, yeah, roughly. And they all ran off. And we found out in a, sh in, a, in a few days where they really ran, where they ran to was a women's camp uh, was a couple miles away where they had French women and Polish women and everybody, all the women they collected up who were they using for labor in the fields and other things. Well, I didn't see them when they came back, but the colonel ordered them back and they finally all came back. And the people who did see them said they were smiling and uh, so we waited. The Russians had us round up all the cattle and, they, uh, and get the butchers in, the people in the camps who were butchers, uh, and uh, slaughtered them and served this so we had lots to eat and the Russians gave us bread and medical help and all that sort of thing. It was uh, a grand occasion and in a short time later, in the local airfield, German airfield, uh, which was no longer a German airfield, it was a Russian airfield or, <laughs> or an American airfield, whatever you call it. Uh, bombers began landing, big bombers, just like the one we flew, except they were called B-17s. They landed, dozens of them landed, and they took all of us and flew us into France. By that time, there were close to 9,000 air officers in this camp. And we found, just before we left, we found a number of things in the records. We found our individual records. We passed them out, and I have this record with the front and side view and my German assigned number on it. And we also found a communication from Hitler's headquarters that the German commandant should get his crew and kill all the prisoners. Well, it doesn't take much brains to know that he declined to do that, regardless of the orders from Hitler, the headquarters itself. So here we were in France, in a, in a almost appropriately named airfield called Camp Lucky Strike. It was lucky, N-A-L-R. And 
so here we were processed. We were given clothes, new clothes, money, and everything that we needed as soldiers and officers. And we then prepared to go home. And what an occasion, what a thing. We got to actually call our relatives, and, and I called my wife, and Gladys, how are you? And she said, how am I? It's, how are you, Bob? And I said, I'm okay. She said, oh, thank, thanks, thank goodness, thank goodness, and so on. Um, oh, there were also the little funny things that left over from the camp. postcard to, to get and, uh, and I got a postcard it was from my doctor my family doctor in Detroit and it, it wasn't from him personally his receptionist and she wrote on this she said dear Robert uh, I just wanted to remind you that o you owe us $38 and we would like you to pay this it's been some time now and we would really appreciate you paying this money uh, thank you very much so I took one of my precious co postcards and I wrote back and I said, I wrote to the doctor, Dear Maury, uh, I received your nice postcard and I have every intention of paying that. Unfortunately, at this moment, I am tied up. Uh, and anyhow, I will see you soon. And in the meantime, I wish you were here, Bob. <laughs> so <laughs> anyhow, uh, there I am, back home. And I went through a few little shenanigans about getting discharged because there were a big jam up and discharging everybody because by then it was, uh, the war was over in the East too, or shortly after, and uh, the war in Japan, with Japan and so on. And anyhow, in a short time I was home and shortly arrived my pay for being in the prison camp. I mean, my regular ordinary pay, including the flying pay. So I had a nice little chunk of money to spend. Oh, when I first arrived home, before my daughter was born, uh, my wife showed me a number of documents she'd collected in one thing. And one thing she showed me was a telegram from the War Department. And it said something like, the, the a uh, War Department regrets to inform you that your husband, Robert Purdy, was shot down on December 28, 1943. Further news, ta-da, 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 ta-da. That was the regret to inform letter. That one of the things that was so marvelous being home and seeing my mother and my father and my uh, uh, Alan and Jimmy and all that sort of thing that it's unbelievable how good that felt. Uh, but something horrible was in the air. They didn't, nobody had told me, and I asked about Harry, and they said, oh, we expect he'll be home pretty soon. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, we were told that he was shot down. He was flying out of England with a B-24, and his crew was shot down. And Half the crew was killed, and they said they didn't know who these people were that lived through it yet, because they, uh, the plane had crashed in a forest in Germany, and the information wasn't through. Within a few weeks, the bad news came. Harry was dead. He was killed in the crash. This is one of the horrible moments of my life. I still don't forget that. That's deep in me and always will be. What a good guy. What a friend, what a brother. Just so, so sad, I can't talk about it. This whole post-war thing, of course, was marvelous for me being home. And um, seeing everybody starting to do things and oh, one of the little odd things that happened to me was my hair turned gray inside of, uh, I think it was a little less than a year after I got home, my hair com turned completely gray. And also all my hair in back 
back here, sell out. And of course I went to the doctor and he told me this is post-traumatic shock uh, or stress. And he said the hair will go back within a few months and you may just stay gray. And the hair grew in and it stayed gray. And there I was with my wife and we were in a little apartment and after celebrations and resting up a bit, I got a job <laughs> because that's what I do. I work for a living. And then our life started off a whole new life, the post-war life. And about a year later, as we'd hoped, we had a child. And that was Laura. My lovely daughter Laura was born in 1946. Well, here we were. Um, Alan settled down, had married and settled down and had three children. And um, Jimmy was married. And we, over this period of time, had three children also. And uh, we all were settled down and getting to work and getting together with friends and relatives and uncles and all the rest. And of course, my mother and father, uh, who were good friends to us. And my mother, of course, was still in her world. Uh, and she didn't get to see us. Of course, she was never quite the same again. My mother and she were just nuts. And in fact, uh, we wanted to have every body brought back to Uh, one place I worked with that took it on two and a half months, and the other place took two days and a half, and then I went home. And I worked there for three, four years, and I became the um, educational director of the local. didn't help anything and I, I couldn't help it it was part of the stress business and anyhow I think that was a thing basically and she went off with uh, Laura and shortly after that I pulled up stakes and moved to California I sort of wanted to get away from all that and then began, began a whole different life. 